Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Mace. How's my sound? Is it okay? All right. <laughs> All the thumbs up. It's good to see everybody. How are you doing? It's been a couple weeks since I've been with you. Yeah. And uh, Eve kicked off Lo Jong last week. It looks like she did a great class and laid a good foundation. And it's a pleasure for me to get to loop back around with a lot of familiar faces in the early days, back when we were under a different name. <laughs> we did uh, uh, over a year of Lo Jong. And um, I just never get tired of it. It's so deep. It's so good. And it's so applicable to everyday life, even now, after so long. I mean, these teachings came to Tibet around the 11th and 12th century CE. And so here we are benefiting, you know, eight, nine hundred years later. And uh, let's dive in now with some practice. And then we can talk a little bit about the next couple slogans. So go ahead and make yourself comfortable. Find a seat that is conducive to turning inward and enjoying this practice time together. We'll sit for about 30 minutes. I'll walk us through the nine, <clears throat> I'm sorry, not the nine, the seven, the seven point Vairochana posture, classic uh, meditation posture that uh, is taught as a framework for our seat. Of course, you can modify any of it. And the first is <clears throat> the position of the eyes. So you can either have the eyes closed if that's comfortable for you at the beginning. Later I'll ask you to open them a little bit. Uh, the formal Vairochana seven-point posture is actually with the eyes slightly open, gazing at a comfortable downward angle towards the floor. The eyes are soft and relaxed, not staring. But of course, if it helps you to ease into meditation by having the eyes closed, that's certainly a good option. The next point is the positioning of the tongue. So by resting the tongue at the upper palate, right at the root of the front top teeth, it does a couple things. One is it helps to close the circuit of the flow of prana within the body. It said there's this microcosmic orbit, so to speak, and Chinese medicine and the, the yogic traditions have a similar understanding of the up and downward flow of prana through the body and by closing the circuit we help to cycle the energy and not leak it. I'll never forget a Tibetan Geshe when I was studying in Dharamsala in 96 said in the classes I was taking at the time there at the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives in Dharamsala that another function of the tongue is to make sure that when you're in deep states of long meditation, like three, four hours, you won't drool <laughs> by keeping the tongue in that position. Relax the jaw. Relax the muscles of the face. The third point is the position of the chin. We draw it back slightly towards the center of the throat, lengthening the back of the neck. So do an experiment now. Jut the chin forward and notice how it shortens the back of the neck. And then gently draw the chin back towards the center of the throat that lengthens the space at the neck and the base of the skull. It's said that the shape is like a shepherd's crook. The shape of the neck and the chin. <clears throat> The fourth point is the shoulders, relaxed away from the ears, slightly drawn back and down. The arms are relaxed. The next position is the fifth, the hands. You can either place them 
palms down on the thighs or in your lap in the mudra of meditative equipoise with the left hand beneath the right and the two thumbs touching in your lap. This is the classic posture. The sixth is the spine, nice and straight. Notice if you're slouching or hunched over. Try to lift through the spinal column all the way up and out through the crown of the head. And if you're on your back, just make sure the spine is straight and not bent. The image is like that of a stack of golden coins, the vertebrae stacked one atop the other. And then the seventh point is that of the legs. The classic posture is full lotus position called Vajra position in Tibetan. Most of us can't do that, that's fine. A comfortable cross-legged position or even sitting in a chair, of course, with the feet flat on the floor. Most important is that you have good circulation and the hips are comfortable. <coughs> So now you've taken your seat upon your contemplative throne. You're claiming your sovereignty. Claim your space here, this precious moment of practice together. And take a moment to arouse a heartfelt motivation for your practice and your life. This bodhicitta, the aspiration to awaken for the benefit of yourself and others. And now really feel the breath drop down into the belly and releasing tension with the out breath. Land even more fully in the present moment with the breath in your body. <coughs> Noticing if there are any little remnants of tension or holding unnecessarily. Release it with the out breath. Like a sigh of relief, you don't have to hold this anymore. Give it back to the earth. And let that natural sense of ease and buoyancy flow through you with each breath. a lightness of being, a returning to a wholesome goodness that's always within you, simplicity and presence. And we'll begin with this soothing practice of shamatha, calm abiding, Developing relaxation and concentration, stability. Letting the breath be your anchor as usual. This smooth, silky breath flowing in and out, soothing you into a deeper state of concentration and relaxation. Each breath is an invitation to come home again and again and again. The concentration aspect is that gentle staying and the remembering to return when you've strayed. You're developing the muscle of concentration. It sounds so sterile, but in fact, when we're aligned in the moment with the breath in the body, it opens up a flow of prana that can be quite blissful. Let that be your little carrot for 
We're tending to the breath and releasing, releasing distraction with the out-breath. Coming home to the body, the cycle of the flow of the breath flowing in and flowing out. You can label thought as it arises, thought, and then come back to the breath wherever it is in the arc of its circle. Settling the body in its natural state at ease, relaxed, aligned with gravity. Settling the speech in its natural state in quietude, also referring to the flow of the breath a natural, uncontrolled breathing, like a sleeping baby. Natural, at ease rhythm, unforced. Settling the mind in its natural state, not the habitual state of thinking, grasping onto thought and being distracted hither and yon, but the natural state, limpid, clear, unbound by grasping onto this and that a natural unraveling, a release. As soon as the knot of thought starts to tighten, soften the grip and settle the mind in its natural state, spacious, luminous, present, Each out-breath can soften that grip to relearning and unlearning and settling back into your natural resting state.
And now, having established a relative level of uh, calm and shamatha of the breath, I invite you now, if the eyes are closed, to open the eyes slightly, mindfully, letting in the visual field, but not judging or fixating on it. Just soften the gaze of the eyes, let them rest at a comfortable angle, past the tip of the nose, soften the muscles behind the eyes, and stepping one more step into the beautiful practice of settling the mind in its natural state. Where we attend to the domain of the mind rather than the breath as our shamatha anchor. the eyes open, there's a quality of the mind pervading space, not just being behind the eyes and the head. Consciousness does not only live in the body. And thoughts may appear as bubbling up clouds or impressions. Don't get fixated on it, but with the eyes open, we have a sense of being able to observe the domain of the mind. And this domain of the mind is the anchor of our shamatha. And rather than preferring empty mind or no thinking, we sit back and we are open to whatever stimuli, whatever thoughts, feelings, impressions arise within the field of awareness. And with equanimity, without preference or pushing away, we observe and release. Release back into the open, spacious quality of presence and wakefulness that is always there. If you're tired, observe tired. If you're agitated, observe agitated. Don't judge it. Just be and release any fixation that you may perceive arising around impressions coming and going. you need the breath to anchor you, it can be like a buoy in the ocean, you're a deep sea diver. You can have one hand on the buoy of the breath to help you stay grounded and present in the body. But the observing the domain of the mind is like putting on a mask and looking under the ocean water. Observing that domain, that space, the vast space of the mind.
Keep releasing with the breath. Opening the aperture of your awareness. It is said that the nature of mind is vast like space. Space pervades you. It's not just out there. We are 99.9% .9 space between the cells and molecules. So open to that truth. The mind is vast like space, and that awareness pervades all of experience. When in doubt, release with the out-breath. When distracted, release with the out-breath. When exhausted, release with the out-breath. When bored, release with the out-breath. And for the last few minutes, we'll do a little self donglen, a little sending and receiving, nurturing for the, your heart. Allow the eyes to close again, gently. And just internally gaze down into the heart space, this deep cavern, the cave of the Hridaya, the heart cave. It's your innermost dimension of the home base within you. And breathe directly in and out of this deep cavern, this deep, beautiful, dark, luminous cave of the heart. Breathing in and out, aerating this space that is the dimensionless space. feel that any strands of disconnect or discord that's been floating around in your life today or in this meditation, just touch it with the breath and invite it into this deep heart space of healing, of luminous potentiality. Let it come home, nurture it with the in-breath as if you were a mother holding a baby close to you, bringing it to your heart. And as you breathe out, soften and allow it to be. Don't fix it. Don't fight it. Just allow it to soften and release, reintegrate. Stay and breathe in. Breathe in any fragment, any resistance, anything you would rather not have in your awareness. Bring it home right now. This is the taking, this lening of the tonglen. The len is to take. By choice, you choose to bring home that which you would normally push away. What is that in you? And the out-breath is the sending of love and space and acceptance, whatever the remedy is for that ailment with the out-breath. The tong is the sending, is the giving. The inhale is the 
taking in the receiving into the heart space. Welcome it home. And the exhale is the tong, the giving of space, acceptance, just simplicity. Let this ride the breath. Make friends with this innermost space of the heart. Aerate it, open it up, breathe into it. And with the out breath releasing and reintegrating these fragmented energy patterns that keep us feeling separate and divided. Even if you can just manage to open a little bit, that's a good start. No judgment, just be, be true to yourself here. Let the whole body feel nourished by this breath and this reintegration of welcoming ourselves home to wholeness. This is shamatha, calmly abiding in our wholeness. Now, just gently release any thought or effort or interpretation or rumination. Just release, release, release. And just return to this feeling of settling in your natural state for a few moments. Simply resting and allowing yourself to be, just be. And then now we'll close. And when you're ready, slowly begin to open your eyes and maintain this quality of mindfulness as you come back into this space. Thank you. So I'd love to open it up for any comments or questions about the practice. It's, it's nice to be able to um, clarify if there's anything that needs to be clarified. I don't know if the chat function is open, but if it could be, that's nice. Um, 
And if you are complete, that's good too. There's no compunction, just an open invitation. questions I might have for you, or how was it to transition from mindfulness of the breath, the breath being your anchor in shamatha, to mindfulness of the domain of the mind, settling the mind in its natural state, so the mind is the anchor. It's a little less tactile, it's more nebulous, it's a little more advanced, you could say. Someone said, um, is the use of naming a major part of your practice not a major part of the Tibetan practice, which is mainly my home? I've done other Vipassana-style practice uh, retreats and so on where naming is more a part of it. And certainly you can label th thoughts thought, but we don't go too far into naming past, present, future or feeling, right, or memory. Some traditions get just a little more specific. But the main objective, no matter what tradition you're in, that naming is, is to have a moment of recognition. Oh, thought, or feeling, emotion, and then come back right away. We're not going into it further. We're noticing that that's what that is. And um, we're training ourselves to come back. The term in Sanskrit is vikalpa. Vikalpa is the word vikalpa, V-I-K-A-L-P-A. -K vikalpa literally means rumination or involuntary thought. <laughs> so it's how we spend a lot of our day. And so meditation is about harnessing that in a way, but in a relaxed way, of calming that habitual pattern of the mind to ruminate and to be able to rest in a centralized, focused way in order to, whether it's solving problems or do our art or our work or our meditation, investigation into the deepest nature of reality, you name it. <laughs> when the mind has shamatha, that's what this practice is. It's the calm abiding, concentrated mind that they can then, then go deeper into uh, healing, dismantling egoic uh, hope and fear. It's a tool. It's not the end all be all. Will you always have vi uh, shamatha coupled with vipassana? Shamatha is calm abiding, concentration. Based on that, then we probe into the nature of self and other phenomenon, thought, through vipassana, deep looking or clear insight into the nature of thought, self, reality. Those And those aren't al always necessarily so separate, you know. You can develop a certain stage of calm abiding and then have a launching pad into naturally just seeing into the emptiness of breath or thought, and we've talked about that in the past. We label breath a thing, but under deeper vipassana investigation, we realize it's actually like, where is the breath really? Is it the inhale? Is it the end of it? Is it the breath retention? What is the breath exactly? Is it the functioning of the lungs? Yeah, so naming can help, but not too much emphasized in this Tibetan tradition. Someone said, I appreciate the separation of body fullness and mindfulness. Thank you. Yeah. And another person said, I really appreciated the heart opening part of the meditation. Yes. You can use that as needed. You know, there are times we sit down and shamatha comes quite naturally, but there are other times when we've got some stuff that needs to come home. <laughs> And it's good to be able to say, oh, I have something for that too. I can meet this. 
and breathing into the heart. This is self Tonglen. This is often taught as the first stage of Tonglen. So I thought we would start to approach Tonglen in a step-by-step -step manner. And it said that working with oneself is a very important first step. Two hands are raised, and no, I wasn't aware of the hands. I, you know, it's funny, I, I don't see the hands. I can call on people. Uh, oh, there are the hands. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Hands. <laughs> Go ahead. So, Barbara, do you know how to unmute yourself? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so, I have a couple of questions about. Um, not necessarily this specific meditation that we did, but I tend, but it's been coming up a lot more as I've been doing meditations with people online or just on my own, is that I always have a piece of music in my head. Um, not original, which would be nice, but uh, <laughs> so either a song or a, a segment of instrumental music or something, and it's really hard for me to get it to go away mm. um, and if I think about it it tends to get if I focus on it or become more aware of it it tends to get worse and, and lately what's been happening is that then this song that I particularly don't want to think about <laughs> comes in um, and I'm not quite sure what to do it reminds me of that famous saying that which you resist persists <laughs> yeah right so so how to meet it but without resistance it reminds me of the story that jack cornfield told that he was a monk in the thai monastery as a young man and he had these episodes of these long sits where he was going through a period of involuntary movement and his arms would flap up to the side in the middle of this hall with everybody quiet and still and he's waving his arms in this weird way and the more he tried to control it and stop it the worse it got so he went and asked for an interview from his teacher and his he explained what was happening and the teacher said just view it don't try to stop it just watch it just view it and so that can be very challenging to just view. We're so ingrained to try to change things or do away with what we don't want. But I would ask you, Barbara, are, have you, you know, if you haven't already, <clears throat> try to come at it as like, oh, here's the music again, music, like name it in that moment. You could say music mm -hmm. or sound and then just open into an awareness without preference or pushing away. That's the settling the mind in its natural state technique where you're actually just unraveling any resistance to what's happening in you right now, whether it's music or rumination, vikalpa. I mean, in a way, the, the mind fixating on music is just another form of rumination. Right. It's just showing you that there's a habitual pattern in there and that the mind training can help but it takes time to undo I, yeah, I can try it seems like as soon as okay I, I mean I thought that and I, I thought in a way that that's what I was doing when I was I was noticing it and letting it be but then the other song would come in the one. <laughs> The one I don't want <laughs> so this much. This is just a great loud, in. <laughs> right upfront okay. example of how the mind wants to, is always entertaining itself with different things. <laughs> I mean, for you, it's music. For other people, it's thinking or well, that too imagery. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, the second I'm woke up in the morning, even in the middle of the night, it's like there it is. So, um, hmm. Okay, well, so just... You could do a feeding your demons practice around that, too, to meet it, in it from a different angle. Okay. Have you, do you know, you know the feeding your demons yeah, practice, right? Yeah, Have yeah. you done it with that? No. Okay, do that. That's your homework. Okay. Then you might <laughs> want to do it a couple times, but just do it once and see if there's a shift. 
There's something there and the resistance to it is keeping it there. I think that's what my hit is. Right. And to do that. Okay. We're yeah. just open to it. I have yeah, a second question about the mind versus brain. So that the brain is not the mind. And yet if something happens to the brain, it can definitely like dementia or an injury or toxins from your internal organs that liver's going bad. Um, it can definitely affect how much control you can have over your mind. Mm -hmm. So how does that? We can think of the brain and also the body, the full nervous system, the organs, the whole system as like the filter, the filter through which consciousness perceives the world. And so, yes, if it's damaged or um, going through illness, uh, it can affect the way we perceive the world, definitely. But the what the Buddhists say is that the mind is not the brain. They're not the same thing. Right. Right. So, but I'm, I guess I'm just asking, though, but then when the brain is affected, it definitely affects the mind. It can, definitely. Yes, it's a two-way street. Definitely the body, whether it's you're talking about just the brain or the liver, it affects the mind or you know consciousness, and consciousness can affect the body, too. So it's a two-way street. They're not exactly the same, but they're not separate. As long as we are in the body, our consciousness is filtering through the sense organs of the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the ears, and then also tactile sense. And then the sixth sense in Buddhism is, the, is actually the mind. Because all of those sensory impressions are being filtered through our consciousness, like, oh, that's good, oh, that's bad, oh, that's sweet. There's the commentary happening. But if you can no longer meditate or focus or can, I mean, so where are you with your mind or your consciousness at that point? I'm witnessing my husband's mother die of Alzheimer's right now. She's still there. She's still deep in there somewhere, but mm -hmm. she can't talk. She can't open her eyes, but it doesn't mean her mind is gone. Really, I mean, from the Buddhist perspective, it's the moment of the final, the final moment, the dissolution and the breaking down of the functions of the body, whether it's the brain or the heart that's last to go. Or it's at that point when the body is broken down and it can no longer support our consciousness that the mind then releases from the physical form and then enters what's called the intermediary state or the bardo. And it said that that bardo lasts for seven cycles of seven days, 49 days. 49 days. Mm -hmm. And then after that, the, 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 that subtle bardo body may go on to other dimensions, depending on its karma. Right. If you've done certain spiritual practices, you might go to different realms, like uh, Tara's blissful realm of Sukhavati, the Potala Palace of Green Tara. I wouldn't mind going there. I've been thinking about that a lot lately. <laughs> but you also have Buddha realms. It's have these ideas. I mean, perhaps there's states of consciousness. We don't want to necessarily get locked into thinking that there are different heavens out there. But then the body, the, the, that, the mind, the consciousness, your substrate, the alaya vijnana, is said to be this consciousness that moves from one body to the next. If there's karmic magnetism drawing you into taking form again you will you might be drawn to the mother father in union so to speak if you're not born in an egg i'm and, thinking i'm sorry and then you you'll reincarnate again and again so I that is the buddhist is, kind of abhidharma yeah. that's the understanding of the nature of consciousness i guess i'm thinking of more at the time when your mother-in-law is there but not there her mind is there, but she has she can't do any what she wants with it. The mind is there. It's just really like the veils are so thick. Mm. And what I see with her is she's adjusting to her reality moment by moment, day by day. So I can think, oh, poor Lynn. She can't talk. And she can maybe think that as well. 
but I don't know that because she can't communicate it. And there's also a part of me that sees that she's actually been adjusting to her new reality of going softer and deeper and deeper. Okay. Okay, Barbara. Yeah, I want to also allow time for other questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good questions. There was another hand raised. Who's that? Joe, um, I think I can unmute you. Hi. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, first of all, that's a, um, it's a vulnerable, real thing to share about the mother-in-law. And yeah, it's interesting to hear how like a conception of the mind independent of the brain to a certain extent can like give you hope in like witnessing that I thought that was kind of beautiful um so a comment briefly and then a question about the practice um then I wanted to say thank you because it's been a long while since I've actually sat like for a proper duration where I could settle in with the stability and kind of like samadhi was the word I learned right just that like mm -hmm and reliability of the mind with something and bringing I don't know all the Tibetan terms I'm sorry but bringing the bringing that stillness then back to the Tongwen practice where you're like opening the heart and welcoming things in it gave me a chance to like actually feel like that like bitter loneliness that's just been there for months and that I haven't wanted to feel fully and to like actually be able to hold it so it wasn't overwhelming. So just thank you for that opportunity. Um, like I knew that's a thing meditation can offer, but I haven't experienced it in a while. So it meant a lot. Yeah. Um, so the question is about that shift. I think it's shamatha, right? The, mm -hmm. the shift from breath, which is embodied, and I understand that, to the mind as the kind of focus object, as it were. Um, when I was doing it, I found myself kind of defaulting to like an open awareness kind of practice where I was like, well, just let all of the sensory things in, don't distinguish or judge between them. And just anytime you fixate on something, let go. And then I kind of assumed that the mind would be whatever's left over. <laughs> um, but I don't know if that is exactly what's being asked of just are there any tips for observing the mind as opposed to the other sense gates mm, yeah yeah it's interesting because what we often do uh, i think uh, eve does this a lot too our mentor both of us studied with a wonderful teacher for many years named alan wallace who's like the shamatha king <laughs> king of shamatha in the West, at least, it's his main mission. And there are many different ways to develop shamatha. And of course, breath awareness is the most common. And with breath awareness, we're more, it's kind of more of a narrow scope where you're really trying to calm that rumination down, retrain the mind to stay, stay, stay. But then there's this other aspect that I mentioned of settling the mind in its natural state that is um, more spacious and in that way can be a little more uh, unwieldy. But when you can train up in resting in awareness of the domain of the mind, so this is instruction on how to rest with the mind as your object, okay? So it's that's when we open the eyes. And it, the feeling is if you could look into the domain of the mind, it's here, it's here between you and me, yeah? And so thoughts and impressions, feelings, all those other sensory perceptions are going to keep bubbling up and passing through this sixth sense of the domain of the mind. And the beauty of that practice is that you are, rather than earlier with the shamatha practice of the breath awareness, where you're really just preferring to stay with the breath and you're trying to be more focused and controlled, which has its benefit, you're, you're, un, you're opening that valve and you're actually welcoming anything, the music, you know, the hunger, the utter boredom, whatever it is, 
and you're observing it without judgment. It's that equanimity, the tangyom in uh, Tibetan, this uh, upeksha, it's the fourth of the four measurables. That quality of equanimity and stability and total presence, just like you've developed with the breath awareness, is more focused, but you're opening it up. And that has such wonderful implications for your life because then you become more spacious in your life. And you learn to meditate in your life because the eyes are open and you're like, oh, here's somebody yelling at me. Wow, this feels really uncomfortable in my body. Oh, but I'm here, I'm breathing, I've got space. Can I take it in and witness them? And you know, it helps us be more interrelational, in fact. Okay, and then what Alan teaches is then even more subsequent forms of shamatha, which is then you have awareness of awareness, and then you have mixing awareness with space. So what we did tonight are the first two levels of these four levels that he often teaches that are more advanced, because you have to develop stability. You don't have to achieve the nine states of shamatha. I mean, that's going to take long-term retreat. But you have to get a certain degree of shamatha. Most of us, I hate to break the news to you, and I'm including myself here, most of us are still needing the training wheels, still working to stabilize our attention span because of our life, fast-paced, digital world. We're distracted. So don't hop over that. We have to do that, but we have to find a way to do it where, that we like, right? We want it to be fun. <laughs> So sometimes breath awareness is good, sometimes resting, settling the mind in its natural state, which tends to be more of my go-to, and it's sounding like, Joe, you have a natural propensity for that. But you can always start with 21 cycles of breath just to drop in and then open. Something like that. Enjoy it. Play with it. Claudia, okay, you had your hand raised, you've been patient, and now you've just chatted. I think you just answered my question as you're answering Joe, but I have another question. When you talked about opening your heart, okay, let's help Claudia get her hand. Okay, there you are. Unmuted, Claudia. Hi. Oh, I'm trying to unmute you, but it didn't work. So we can't hear you yet. Okay, there, there you go. No. Katie. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes there we oh, go. Okay. okay. Um, so when you said to open your heart to something that you resisted or something, I guess what came to mind for me, an incident today, you know, of like reactivity to a trigger. So that's what I brought into my heart of course i would try to resist that but then you said welcome it right and then and then the second part was what to let it go to right that is the exhale so with the inhale we welcome it in and then with the exhale so remember the inhale with tonglen is this taking in that which we, we would normally push away which you got which you did and the exhale is the giving or the sending. So when we're sending in our own body matrix, body-mind matrix, the way it feels to me is that I'm giving it space to be there. I'm giving it a chance to reintegrate. Because it might have been a blob over here or a tightness over there resistance there but if we can breathe it into the heart space and then soften with the out breath it's a visceral feeling of like reintegrating these different tendrils within us that have been spazzing out <laughs> you know so you're harnessing your energy but another way you can feel it claudia is the antidote so in the tonglen formally you're breathing in that which you'd normally push away resist and then you're breathing out the antidote to whatever that ailment is. So you could also be like, okay, I'm breathing in my resistance to that person or that scenario, and then I'm breathing out a spacious acceptance or capacity to be with the feeling. Whatever you feel is your antidote, 
can also ride the out breath. So if that helps you, you could also bring that into it. Okay. But I try to let this tonglen for the self be less mental and more somatic. Did you get that? There's some magic that can happen there. And then that magic can translate into when you're working with others, your loved ones, your neutral people and your enemies, the world. Those are the different stages that we work through with the tonglen. So self, tonglen, very important to do first, if we can. Once you get adept at it and comfortable with it, you can just do tonglen on the go and like work on it with that challenging person, Claudia, right? You can work on it with people in your life. You don't always have to do yourself first. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank nice. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Really nice to hear your voices. I forgot we could raise hands. So now let's shift into the teaching part of our evening. We'll see how far we get and, um, and then we'll continue in the coming weeks. You know, we have 59 slogans. This could take over a year. <laughs> we are not in a hurry. And uh, we'll at least get through one, if not two tonight. So Eve introduced the first slogan, train in the preliminaries, and you contemplated those preliminaries. So that's wonderful. It's a great foundation. And then the second main point, and also Katie is making available a PDF that I, I made a long time ago with all those slogans, so she can paste that if she hasn't already in the chat, and if you want, you can click on it and download it onto your device and refer to it in the coming classes. So, the second point so as you probably remember from last class, if you were there, there are seven, in this system that we're doing, there are seven main points of mind training. There are different systems. There's the eight point mind training as well. But this one comes from Chekawa Yeshe Dorje, who lived in the 11th century, I believe. I can check his dates, but I believe it's the 11th, might be 12th century. And he codified the great master Atisha's teachings on mind training and wrote this book called uh, The Seven Point Mind Training. So that's the text we're using in this class. You may find others in your research. Great, they're all beautiful. But this is from the one by Chekawa Yeshe Dorje. So now we're entering into the second point of the seven point mind training. And there are many slogans within the points, right? So point number two is the main practice, which is training in bodhicitta. The main practice, which is training in bodhicitta. So I want to define bodhicitta. It's a deep term, and we talk about it a lot, but it actually has a, some different aspects to it that you might not be aware of. So, Generally, there is an understanding of bodhicitta on both the relative level and bodhicitta on an absolute level. So relative level bodhicitta includes our bodhisattva training to be of benefit in the world, generous, kind, and so on. And that consists of two aspects. The Buddhists are really good with outlines, by the way. <laughs> so here, get ready, outline minds. With relative bodhicitta, you have two aspects. The first is aspirational bodhicitta, the wish of bodhicitta. And what do we do with that one? That's where we find the four immeasurables. So aspirational bodhicitta includes the meditative practices of the four immeasurables, or what are called the Brahma Viharas in the earlier teachings, the divine abodes. What are they? Loving kindness, compassion, equanimity, and joy. Those four measurables. How many people are familiar with those practices? Raise your hand. Good. So those are, that is the bodhicitta practice in aspiration, meaning we are aspiring to develop those qualities. Some may already have those qualities. Some we may need to train up more in. The second aspect of 
relative bodhicitta is bodhicitta in action. Now you're going to get off your cushion and put it into action. And bodhicitta in action consists of the six perfections. Eve talks about the six perfections a lot when she talks about the container for our class. So it's putting our practice into action too, in the world, in our studies, wherever we are. The six perfections are generosity. Being generous with our time, our resources, our love, our attention. The second is discipline, having kind of an ethical discipline within our life. The third is patience, developing patience, forbearance. The fourth is enthusiastic effort or diligence. The fifth is concentration, like what we do in shamatha, developing a stable, concentrated, relaxed mind. And then the sixth is developing wisdom through vipassana, in fact. Those last two ones entail shamatha vipassana on a certain level. You can understand that's how we could deepen those. There's, I could spend all month on the six perfections too, so I'm not going to take that much time in this class. And I know a lot of you have studied the path of the Bodhisattva where they go deep into the Bodhi, the six perfections. How many people have studied Shanti Deva's text, The Way of the Bodhisattva? Yay! So you know the six perfections, right? Maybe. Please repeat number five. Yes, concentration. Five is concentration. Six is wisdom. So those, the four measurables and the six perfections make up the wonderful profound training of relative level bodhicitta. Got it? Then you have absolute level bodhicitta, which is really cool. What is it? It is shunyata. <gasps> bodhicitta is emptiness? What? What? But emptiness is cold and sterile. No! Shunyata is not that kind of emptiness. <laughs> Shunyata is a warm, fuzzy kind of emptiness. <laughs> because it's the interconnected fullness of all reality, perception, appearances. It is the pratita samutpada. Try to say that one fast. <laughs> Pratita samudpada, which means the tendral, the interconnected interdependence of everything. And because things are interdependent, they are empty of separate, solidly existing selfhoods. Things are not like this, they're like this. Not like this, like this. This is tendral, this is interdependence. And because things are empty of intrinsic, separate existence, because instead they are interconnected, they are imbued with a quality of warmth, and we are imbued with a quality of heartfelt com compassion. When we wake up to the truth of our interdependence, compassion naturally flows out from that. That's why it's bodhicitta on an absolute level. Because when we really have a visceral experience of unmediated shunyata, we're f overflowing with love. So what is absolute bodhicitta? What is emptiness? It is on the one level a direct understanding of emptiness imbued with compassion. And because of that, we awaken to our primordial, pure from the very beginning nature of mind. So uh, ultimate bodhicitta is also the nature of your own mind. It is who you really are. So bodhicitta is not a trivial term. You've got relative level, which is more like compassion, equanimity, joy, patience, like be good. 
But then you've got this deeper fullness. And for those familiar with Mahayana teachings, it's Prajnaparamita, this perfection of wisdom, the womb of totality, the genetrix of the awakened state, the mother of the Buddhas, your own true nature. That is absolute bodhicitta. Okay, so we're in point number two. And now I want you to understand that s the slogans that are in point number two have two aspects. So the f slogans number two through six, you already touched on two with Eve last time, right? Regard all dharmas as dreams. So that's second slogan. We'll go into the third, maybe fourth slogan tonight. Those up till six, two through six slogans, numbers two through six, are all talking about absolute bodhicitta. This emptiness, interdependence. And then slogans seven through ten are all about relative bodhicitta. That's when we get into the Tonglen practice. So it's so interesting that Chekawa Yeshe Dorje chose to go into the deep end right away. You know, train in the preliminaries and then jump in the deep end. <laughs> so get ready, right? But what the deep end does for you is it gives you perspective. It gives you the view. So you're not kind of going around with a little headlamp in the dark trying to find your way down the path. You're actually blaring the room full with bright light so you see where you are, you see the terrain. And then you can walk your path. So let's look at slogan number three. Examine, examine the nature of unborn awareness. Examine the nature of unborn awareness. Oh my God. So the prior slogan that Eve shared with you, regard all dharmas as dreams, was actually about examining the insubstantial nature of the phenomenal world out there. Everything's appearing yet empty like dreams, like a mirage, like an echo, like a castle in the sky. There are all these metaphors of the dream-like nature of phenomena. We see it, but do they really appear the way that, are they really existing out there the way they appear to my mind here? Recognize that. And now, this third slogan turns that vipassana, that seeing, clear seeing, back into an internal space and says, now examine the non-substantiality of your mind itself. So you could say slogan two is applying vipassana to the outer world phenomena. And slogan number three is applying vipassana to the inner world, your mind. And when I say mind, this is very important. Mind, usually when I'm saying mind, I'm referring to the conceptual mind. The word in Sanskrit is citta, C-I-T-T-A. In Tibetan it's sem, S-E-M. And this is the thinking mind the ruminating mind, the planning mind. This isn't the deep, ultimate nature of mind. It's the waves on the surface. So, absolute bodhicitta, the, meaning the true nature of your own mind, is beyond this thinking mind, sem. So one way that the great Dzogchen masters describe this is that absolute bodhicitta, your own nature of mind, is like the sun. And sem, your thinking mind, is like the rays of the sun that emanate from that source. They are not the same, and yet they are not different. The, the rays are emanations of the sun, so we label rays. They're, set, they're sort of different from the sun itself, but they emanate from it. So sem emanates from the sun 
or the source of your bodhicitta ultimate. Another way of, rec of, of understanding this absolute nature of mind, you can also call it rigpa. Rigpa, it means pristine awareness, which is equal to ultimate bodhicitta. These are synonyms. Rigpa is a Tibetan word that means pristine awareness. So rigpa is that sun. Sem is the rays. Another analogy is that rigpa is like space. And that sem is like the clouds arising and passing, forming out of that space, that pregnant akashic field, you could say the fabric of space, and then dissolving back into it. And so this is why this slogan says, examine the nature of unborn awareness. It's unborn. What does that mean? Well, it's unchanging on this ultimate level. It's always shining like the sun, so to speak. Or it's always there like space. Appearances of day and night may change, but space itself doesn't. That is what we are dropping back into when we're resting in the nature of mind, when we're approaching it through settling the mind in its natural state, we're training up in resting in awareness, in rigpa, rather than the surface fluctuations of the sem, the thinking mind. So this absolute nature of mind is unborn in that respect, and undying. It transcends space and time. It is the innate, spontaneous, ongoing, luminous clarity of mind. Rigpa, pristine awareness. So let's have just a few minutes of experimenting with this now. So let's drop in. If you want to, close your eyes, take a few breaths. And then now open the eyes like we did before, having the gaze soft at a downward angle without staring at anything in particular. Feel as if you could see into the domain of the mind itself. But soften the gaze. It's not like you're trying to see the mind. Just soften into that spacious awareness around you, permeating you. And you may inevitably notice a thought come in. Maybe you hear a sound in the room. Maybe you hear a song playing in your head. Memory. Notice. Where does it come from? Where does it abide? And then where does it go? So let's spend some silent time here. Opening resting, settling the mind in its natural state. And then whenever a thought or sensation arises, see if you can find the source. Where does it come from? The location, where does it abide? And the destination, where does it go? It's a thought experiment. Let's do it. You can intentionally think of a thought if you have to. And watch. And even when these passing thoughts or sensations come and go, they seem to arise 
I'm somewhere, but really there's no findable actual source or destination or location. But the mere looking trips you into an experience of awareness. And rest in that experience of awareness. Just rest in that now. And coming back, did you have a sense of the space of the mind being like the space of this phenomenal world? And within that vast space of the mind, all sorts of colors and shapes and different sounds and appearances, pleasure and displeasure will arise. But none of those things change the actual space itself. Do you understand that? Is that did you taste it even? Did you feel it? <coughs> this is very important. It gives us, it's a, it's a liberating quality. It's very healing. We become less constricted and imprisoned to our thoughts, to our situation. This is why people who have been in prison for decades can come out saying, actually, that was the most powerful teaching of my life. I mean, you hear stories of Tibetans. Uh, there was even uh, teachers who said, yeah, it was hard. The labor was hard. The torture was horrible. But it really focused my mind to practice because they were able, they had the teachings before they went in the skillful means to open the vast space, potentiality of their mind. And nobody can take that away from us. So, Joe says, so is it true in, so is a true insight and experience of unborn awareness, enlightenment, since it would be birthless and deathless, it is a taste of your Buddha nature, yes. But it doesn't mean that you are fully enlightened yet. <laughs> I love the teachings are so practical. You know, I mean, like, you can have Satori moments of like, Whoa, where you get it. But then it can kind of wear off and there you are kicking the dog again, right? <laughs> this old joke. Uh, old Tibetan joke, you know, don't like sit in samadhi and then get up and kick the dog, you know, it just shows that you haven't really become a Buddha. And so what it said is that the, the true Buddhahood is about connecting those dots and remaining in that state of wakefulness, pristine awareness, rigpa, day and night, dream yoga, in the shower, all the time. Jason, yes, it's like a clear blue sky out of which clouds emerge. I saw this while visiting the mountains recently, and the image helps me experience thoughts emerging in my mind out of clear space of my mind. Yes. Being in nature is such a deep teaching and healing uh, as much as we can. And, I, and the use of natural metaphor and teaching is so uh, inspiring and important. Thank you. Yeah. And so here we are at our hour. And so chew on this, ruminate on it in a non clinging way. <laughs> uh, ponder it and, and integrate it into your being. And then next week we will blow it up. <laughs> the next slogan is self liberate even the antidote. I'll give you a hint. That means all this emptiness stuff that's so cool and you think you can apply to everything, liberate that. Don't cling on to that. Don't make emptiness a thing to reify. 
So either whether it's Eve or myself, we will we will keep going, and we're just going to have more and more fun. So thank you, everybody. Let's take a moment to dedicate our time together, our merit for the benefit of all beings, near and far. Emaho, how wonderful. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, and uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Noam. Thanks, Mason, Pamela, and all of you for coming and showing up, making our Sangha what it is. Lots Thank of you, love. Chandra. You're Thank welcome, you, Chandra. Claudia. Thanks. Yeah. Good night. Someday night. we'll be in a room together, won't we? Thank you. Me too. <laughs>